morning. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 16, verses 15 through 18. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we just thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the fellowship that we have with one another. We thank you so much that you love us so unfathomably we cannot even begin to comprehend that you would send your one and only son to die for our sins so that we wouldn't be separated from you, O Lord, but that we would be redeemed, purchased back to you, not only as your possession, Lord, but as your children. Father, as we study your word today and the, the different things about what it means to be a church, Lord. Help us to be filled with the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, walked with the Spirit, fixing our eyes upon Jesus until He returns and makes all things new. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Am I on? Can you hear me? I'm on? Okay. I can't hear myself. If you've never read this little book, it's a great little book that doesn't take long to read. It's called I Am a Church Member. And it talks about all the things that it means to be a member of a church because so many times you're a member of things like the country club or a member of this and that and you go there because of the benefits that it gives you but membership in the body of Christ in your local church means what you can do what you can serve in the church because Jesus came as a servant of all and he said if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven you will become the least of all Jesus told us how to live and he showed us a life of servitude for one another. I gave you these books today because it explains a little bit about church membership. It also explains about what the free Methodists believe and it's a good thing that we go and review this. Maybe it's new for some, maybe it's not for new for some, but maybe you'll sit there and say, hey, I did not realize this. And you know, you don't have to agree with everything, but you need to have the basics that are there that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He did not consider equality with God something to be used for His advantage, but instead He came to earth, humbled Himself, and gave Himself. He said when He goes back to heaven, He will ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit, and He will never be forsake you. He will always be with you. So we believe in a triune God. We believe that salvation comes only through Jesus Christ, Nothing added to that, nothing taken away from that. And if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, not just Savior, but Lord, He is the leader of your life. Jesus called you an ex a disciple and He called you a friend and a brother. If you believe in your heart, then you are saved. If you're saved, you're born again from above, born by the Spirit of God. Nothing can ever separate you from God's love. And you are to grow as a child of God to maturity to be like Christ. If you believe those things, and I summed it up pretty, pretty easy, then you are a Christian and you are called to fellowship with one another to be a part of the body of Christ. Whether it's at this church or another church or wherever, you're called to serve because the Holy Spirit gives you abilities, gives you fruit so that you can share with one another to build up the church of Christ. Jesus said in the scripture that Mark read, he said that he would build his church upon the faith that Peter professed. The faith that said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one that has the words of eternal life. We recognize that you are the one that God sent, his one and only Son, to save us from our sins. And we will follow you because you have the words of life. We will not forsake you and turn away because we don't want just the things that will take care of us. We want to serve God Almighty, and he is standing in front of us in the form of Jesus Christ. 
So if you believe that, then you are born again and you are called to be a part of the body of the Christ. So let's dig into this for just a little bit. If you noticed inside of it, there is also what our positions are here at the church. Normally at the end of the year, first of the year, we hand out what we call a gift and talent survey so that you realize, and it's hard sometimes for you to realize what your gifts and talents are that to be used in the church. A lot of times it's easier to ask somebody else, okay? Because you might not see it yourself. I'll use Bob for an example this morning. He, he thanked me and said that I was very generous. I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing again. That, that built me up. That was wonderful. But he also saw something in me that I might not see in myself. So that's a fruit of the Spirit that I need to use, and I thank Bob for telling me about that. You might not know what your gifts are, but others may see it in you, and you need to be using those gifts to build up the body of Christ and to reach out into the world. So if you see the top place in there, these are member positions. Okay, now we're getting into something. Sometimes it's a little touchy because <laughs> not everybody wants to say that they want to become a member, and that's okay. That doesn't mean their commitment to the church is any less or any more. It just means that they have not went through and said, I want to become a member, that simple. So that's why you won't hear me preaching about it or anything except maybe one time a year because I don't want to get any toes stepped on or anything else. But if you feel led to become a member, then you can fill one of the positions that's up here. That is a safety factor in the church. You don't want someone to come in your church and even be in your church for quite a significant time but not have the belief system that you have and then two or three people gather together like that and all of a sudden your bylaws of your church have changed and this is okay where this wasn't before. So it's a safety factor. If you're not a member, you can fill in any of the other positions down below. There is no favoritism, no, nothing else. It's simply a safety factor. I've been a member of several churches and I didn't go in right at first and become a member. I waited till I saw that this was my fit and everything, even though I might have filled in different positions before that. But when I realized for sure that God was calling me to serve in that church, then Sherry and I became members of that church. <clears throat> Look at these. I didn't out hand out the talent survey. Look at something that you might be interested in, that you might feel led in and get with me and tell me, hey, I would like to serve in this area. If you see a position that's not on here that we need to have on here, then come talk to me about it, and we'll put in that position. If you see the X's, that means we don't have people in that, those positions already that we've already talked about doing it. The reason, for example, that we don't have a youth director, which you could understand would need to be a member of the church and have the same values, is we don't currently have a youth ministry that's active. But that doesn't mean we can't. That doesn't mean God's not calling us. So if you see a need for that, especially come to me and say, God is leading me in this area. And, and we as a church will pray about it and see if we can put that, you know, that ministry forward. Okay? So enough about that. There is also, if you don't know what the job description is, I'm going to put this back on the bulletin board. This explains the job description. I can explain it more for you also. Back on the bulletin board, I'm also going to put, and I want your permission if you're not on here, Names and addresses and emails and phone numbers of each person that's here. This has nothing to do with membership. This is people that attend regularly. Okay? There's also a birthday list and an anniversary list, which I'll make sure yours is updated. If not, I went through and updated all of these things this weekend, I hope. But there are some places that I don't have. I don't have your birthdays, just so you know. Okay? Not pointing you out or anything. Okay, so now let's go through what free Methodists believe. Okay? so that you understand that. What is a Methodist, first of all? Oh, what might come to your mind at first, because we get caught up in the definition, is that there's a methodology to being saved. That's not what a Methodist really means. A Methodist means that back when John Wesley, and I'm going to go over to page, well, I'm going to start with, right here with section one first. There is no church, I'm on page one, without you. What is the church? It's not a building, it's not a place. It is an entity of people. It is God's children living like kingdom children in this earth and for all eternity. Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord today if He is your Savior and Lord at all. And you live for Him today. You have become His disciple, training up to be like Him in this world. And you have something that the Old Testament prophecies long for. You have a personal relationship with God, an intercessor in heaven in Jesus Christ, and an intercessor with the Spirit living inside of you. 
You don't have to worry about the priest going over and over and making sacrifices anymore because Jesus Christ has made the one sacrifice for sin for all time and it was acceptable by, to God. Wow, that is huge. And we are tied together, just like Paul said when he was away from them, he said he was still with them because he's tied together in fellowship because we all fellowship with the Spirit. There is no church without you being a part of it. And it's sad to say in this world today that so many people that profess to be Christians aren't part of a church because they've been hurt or for whatever reason that it is. And that's a sad, sad place to be because God has called you to be a part whether you're the leg or the arm or whatever it is. And see, it makes no sense we can have childlike faith again. If I'm a leg, I don't tell the body to come over here so that I can move around and be a leg like I'm supposed to be. I go fit in with a body so that we can all function accordingly, that we build up and edify the body. Again, I'm paraphrasing drastically what Paul said, but I hope you understand. The church comes together and encounter God to give him honor and praise. We also gather to celebrate the work of God in and through the church and celebrate the sacraments. There's another word that you might not understand the definition of that much. And I'll get back to Methodist, which I think is further in my page, but I mentioned it, so I'll talk about it now. The reason being, when John Wesley got together, he got together in an orderly fashion in the Anglican church, and they saw this and they said, that's like the doctors. They have this method because they're orderly. And the name stuck, Methodist. There is no method except that God himself reveals to you, just like in the declaration of Peter, who Jesus Christ is, and you accept or deny him. And that's your decision. That's a personal decision. We can get into predestination and all those things, but that's a different topic. We can, we can vary some on that, but we've got to be on the basis, again, that Jesus Christ is God, that he died for your sins, that he rose again, he will give you eternal life, you will spend all eternity with him. There is no other way, no truth in life but in Jesus. We don't add anything to that. Sacraments are a holy moment, a special time. Sometimes you'll see, and we'll get into this a little bit more, you'll see means of grace. I don't like that term because, again, what I think it means, means is a, way, a means to a way that you get there by doing this. We only get there because God gives his grace upon grace upon grace upon us. When we take the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, the, blood doesn't become, the wine does not become Jesus' blood. The bread does not become his body. We do it in remembrance of him that he gave his body and his blood for us. And we don't take it in an unworthy manner, as Scripture says, so that we are not defiling uh, the remembrance of Jesus Christ. But we'll get into more of that. Back in the middle of page one, together, together we are, and the followers of Jesus through the world are known as his disciples. So many times Christians don't even realize that. Jesus called us his disciples. And he said, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. He said, if anyone chooses to be my disciple, but longingly looks back at the world, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. Becoming a disciple means that you give up your life to serve your master and Lord because you recognize who Jesus is. We do that with our whole hearts. In fellowship with one another, the church shares in one another's lives with love and concern. In service, the church cares for the needs of its own and for others, but there is no church without you. It's a family of faith, discipleship, fellowship, and service. But why membership? Why is membership important? On the next page, on page two, it's a covenant relationship. It tells you that you have an active partnership and that you're committed. That's what membership does. It says, hey, yes, I am a part of Springs of Living Water. I don't just attend there. I don't just go there. I don't go there regularly. I don't do different things. I believe as a whole and have committed to the body, so therefore I decided to become a member or not. People who, <clears throat> the more people who covenant with one another in sincere love and service with the body of Christ, the stronger we will all become. However, if you decide that membership is not right for you, then you don't have to do it. That's page two. The five questions. Question number one, this is on page three. Do you have assurance that God has forgiven your sins through faith in Jesus Christ? If you don't, that is the question that needs to be answered. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Believe. Question two, do you believe the Bible is God's written word, uniquely inspired by the Holy Spirit, and do you accept its authority for what you must believe and how you must live? We can get into so much there, but the Bible that we have in our hands is the Bible that we have today as God wanted it to be. 
It is His Word. It is truth. You don't take part of it for truth. You take it all for truth. You don't take the parts about, ooh, this and that, but then take the part about love your enemy and say, mm, we don't have to do that one. It is God's Word, His instruction book, His love letter. It is infallible, written by fallible men, directed by the Holy Spirit, and it is as much true today as it was yesterday as it will be tomorrow. Question three, do you resolve by God's grace to be Christ-like in heart and life, opening yourself fully to the cleansing and empowering ministry of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of scriptures and the nurture and fellowship of the church? So if you've got past one and you don't have just a savior for fire insurance and you realize God's word is the truth and there's where you go seek his word diligently so that you can be an approved workman, do you realize that you should be guided by the Holy Spirit? Do you realize what your fruits are or the gifts of the Holy Spirit has given you? And are you using them to build up the church and to, to help usher in the kingdom of heaven in this world? Because I've said this before, if you've heard me say it, that a lot of people know more about Casper the Friendly Ghost than they do the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, he walks with you. The dunamis, dunamis power, dynamite, explosive power that was there at creation, was there when, in Jesus' ministry, was there when Jesus was raised from the dead, and it is inside of each one of us so that the church can be active and powerful. Question four, do you accept the articles of religion, the membership government, the goals for the Christian conduct and government of the Free Methodist Church, and will you endeavor to live in harmony with them? Well, that one's kind of difficult if you don't know what all the Free Methodists believe, okay? There is a book of discipline. If anybody wants a book of discipline, I will give you a book of discipline. It's about this thick, and it talks about every little thing and every little detail. Again, you don't need to know all of it. There's copies in the uh, library that you can go take and put back as well. But basically, we're going to go over the basic concepts. And I'm even going to tell you where I disagree. Oop, did I say that out loud? Okay. Question five, as a follower of Jesus Christ, will you embrace the mission of the Free Methodist Church within and beyond this congregation, and will you join us in giving sacrificially of your time, talents, and resources to help us carry out that mission? The mission, if you don't know it, and it will say it here in this book in a little bit, and these are your copies to keep, is to love God, love people, make disciples. I think that's what Jesus told us, isn't it? Yeah, the greatest commandment and then our great commission. There's a website if you want to go to, too. There's a website for the Free Methodists and for our conference, the, the, free, the uh, River Conference. <clears throat> I'm going to skip now to the next pages. I'm on page five. Membership plus service and membership plus leadership. Under membership plus service, serving one another in a local church is something everyone can do regardless of membership. I hope I've stressed that already. Membership plus leadership, many leadership positions are reserved for those who partner in covenant membership with the church, which I briefly explained earlier. Service means servant leadership, means ministry. Serving one another needs physically and spiritually. Jesus said in Mark 10, 43, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Must be. Page 6 Leaders in the church contribute to the church's mission and direction. They are people of prayer and focus their energy, spiritual gifts, and passions for the good of the whole body. If you're a leg again, you join in with the body so that the body can walk accordingly. Under each of the little bullet points to the side, live consistently within scriptural guidelines, Christ-like attitudes in life and in relationships. Give evidence of your spiritual gifts. Agree with and sincerely seek to live out the goals for the maturing life in Christ. Born again to grow to maturity. Continue in harmony with our doctrine and mission. Are vital in faith, faithful in attendance, and financially supportive of your church in at least the level of a tithe. If you go on to page 7, you can see the organization of the Free Methodist Church. And we're in that big river conference, which is the big one in the center and you hear us talk about not going to some of the meetings and stuff, you can see why it's so big. A lot of them are in Texas and a lot of them in Colorado, so we don't necessarily make all meetings, but anything that's in the Spokane to Seattle area, I always try to attend. Our church is part of Free Methodist Church USA. There's approximately 860 worshiping congregations in the United States, but globally 1.2 million. So you're in a denomination that is spread out all over the world. And I will say this, because I said I'll say something I won't agree with later. 
but I agree more with the free Methodist doctrine than any other church I've been a part of. And I see how active they are in serving globally and training up disciples, and I am proud to be called a free Methodist for that reason. On page 8, under governance, governance, our church finds the origin of its governance in the free Methodist church from its book of discipline, which I've told you about, and this also shows where you can uh, obtain a copy and everything here. All right, now over to the history on page 9. The Methodist... In 1728, ordained, John Wesley was ordained as an Anglican priest in the Church of England. In 1729, started the Methodist Holy Clubs at Oxford because it was orderly. Okay? And then you can see as how it progressed. And then you see on the next page, Benjamin Titus Roberts. In 1852, he was ordained as an elder of the Methodist Episcopal Church. In 1853, attempted to reform the Methodist Episcopal Church. In 1858, he was stripped of his ordination. Then down in 1860, that's what we can call the birth of the Free Methodist Church, meets with 15 preachers and 45 lay persons in, in Pekin, New York. He's elected first bishop of the Free Methodist Church. Well, what was the problem? If you look over beside the, the paragraph beside there, there was slaveholding. There was renting of seats in the church or paying for pews. There was withholding women from full service in the church and a quenching of the movement of the Holy Spirit in public worship. I don't think I could sign up for that church either, could you? So out of the, the church of that day, the free Methodist church was born. Free, that we are free, all races and colors and, and sex, to worship God. That we're free regardless of our monetary status to worship God. That we don't want to quench the Holy Spirit in any way because the Holy Spirit is the guiding power and force behind the church to be like Christ. Well, how in the world could a bunch of sinners come together and be, have, be unified in what they believe and what they do except the power of God living through them? Today we recognize that there is still a distinct need to promote these freedoms and the church, the Free Methodist Church does that today. So page 11, what do we believe? God. The Holy Trinity is the first thing there. The Godhead is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, this is significant because a lot of denominations do not believe in the Holy Trinity. We do. Three persons, equal but different jobs. The Son, the second one, God was himself in Jesus Christ to reconcile people to God. He joined together the deity of God and the human, humanity of humankind. He came to save us. He was a blameless sacrifice for our sins and transgression. One perfect mediator between God and us. In his resurrection and exaltation, Jesus Christ is risen victorious from the dead. His resurrected body became more glorious. He ascended into heaven. He is at the right hand of God the Father where he intercedes for us until all of his enemies shall be brought into complete subjection. He will return to judge all people. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Shouldn't you bow in reverence to, to Jesus now as your king? The Holy Spirit, he is the one that is with the people. He is effective in creation, the life, and in the church. The incarnation and ministry of Jesus Christ were accomplished by the Holy Spirit. He continues to reveal, interpret, and glorify the Son in and through Jesus' brothers and sisters, God's children. The Holy Spirit, His work in salvation. He is the minister of salvation, the agent in our conviction, regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. Maybe you know what all those terms mean, but you don't have to. All you have to do is have childlike faith. He is our Lord's ever-present self, indwelling, assuring, enabling the believer. When a child says, Jesus lives in me, he lives in that child through the Holy Spirit, tying us together so that we will have fellowship and kononia with one another and with God. The Holy Spirit is relationship to the church. It was poured out to the church by the Father and the Son. He is the church's life and witnessing power. What you read in Acts is no different today. Yep. That means that if we're not living like that church in Acts, 
maybe it's a problem with us, not a problem with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is exactly the same. A lot of denominations vary there because they say the miracles and things that were performed then were for that time and that season only. The Holy Spirit is the same today as He was then. And He wants the church to be powerfully moving in this world, righting wrongs, united together. And if we, if we live like that Acts church, would we see more mighty things done for the kingdom? He makes real the lordship of Jesus Christ and the believer so that both his gifts of words and service may achieve the common good and build and increase the church. It's known as the spirit of truth and his instrument is the word of God. That's why I push so much a daily reading plan, a yearly reading plan, and especially where we read together so that we are all reading the same things. The church in Acts again met daily. We don't do that, but at least we can meet daily in, in spiritual with, with what we're reading. And I'm so happy to see a lot of these devotionals gone. If I need to get more, I will. And I hope you've got a partner to do that with you to keep, help keep you faithful because it's so easy to fall out. When people make New Year's resolutions, most of those New Year's resolutions are gone before February 1st. They do it for a short period of time. But we're be, to be here to lift up, to encourage, to grieve with one another to be there in fellowship with one another. Page 13, the scriptures. Authority, they're a trustworthy record of God's revelation. They have been faithfully preserved throughout the years. The scriptures have come to us through human authors as God moved them in the languages and literary forms of their time. God continues by the illumination of the Holy Spirit to speak through, through this word to each generation and culture. You've heard me say before, I don't care which version or translation you use of the Bible because if you're reading a more modern translation, it's been approved by men that the words are basically the same. You won't find the free method to say use a certain uh, Bible or anything. NIVs are what's in our pew. That's just what's in our pew to be consistent. The Bible has authority over all human life. It teaches the truth about God his creation, his people, his one and only son and the destiny of humankind. It also teaches the way of salvation and the life of faith. After a, a experience of being born again, an experience of salvation, there is a life lived of faith. That's why James says, that's why Peter says, that's why John says that you, if you don't believe, if you don't have fruit, if you're not living accordingly, Oh, yeah, you can still get to heaven, the thief on the cross. <laughs> but if you've still got the breath of God in you, he has called you to live for him, and you've been purchased by Jesus' blood, your, your life is not your own. <clears throat> Whatever is not found in the Bible is not required. It's not a necessity for salvation. Again, so many uh, different religious beliefs out there say you need this plus this. Or Jesus is a way. The Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible has all the truth that we, we need. We don't need another book, another revelation on top of that. Authority of the Old Testament. Both Testaments bear witness to God's salvation in Christ Jesus. That's why when I read through and study the Old Testament, I always point what it points to Jesus Christ. God's will for his people. The, the ancient laws for ceremonies and rites and civil precepts for the nation Israel are not necessarily binding on Christians today. But it doesn't mean that you can't practice them. Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So if you've heard it said before that, that you should love your neighbor, but hate your enemy, Jesus said love your enemy just the same. If you've heard before that you shouldn't uh, commit adultery, then Jesus said if you've done it in your heart that you're guilty of that sin. New Testament. Oh, and then there's the books of the Old Testament. I think it's the same ones you'll find in your Bible, I hope. If not, come see me. I want to look to see what Bible you have. The New Testament. The New Testament fulfills and interprets the Old Testament. The revelation of God in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. It is God's final word. And you see the 27 books of the New Testament. Human, humankind or humanity. We are free moral persons. This is difficult for so many people. Why would God create us this way? So that we can choose. We have a choice. God created human beings in his own image, innocent, morally free, and responsible to choose between good and evil. 
right and wrong. But by the sin of Adam, humans of, as the offspring of Adam are corrupt in, it, in their very nature so that from birth they are inclined to sin. They are unable by their own strength and re work to restore themselves in right relationship with God and to merit eternal salvation. Oh, what a pitiful place we're in without Jesus Christ. God, the omnipotent, provides all the resources of the Trinity to make it possible for humans to respond to His grace through faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. God's grace and help, and help uh, by God's grace and help, people are enabled to do good works with a free will. The law of life and love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. As Christ loved and gave Himself up for the church. All people as created by Him and in His image have the same inherited rights regardless of gender, race, or color. They should strive to secure to everyone respect for their person, their rights, and their greatest happiness. Good works. Good works are the fruit of faith in Jesus Christ, but works cannot save us. They are acceptable and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable act of service. Salvation. Christ's sacrifice. Christ offered once and for all one perfect sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. No other sanctification for sin is necessary. None other can atone. That leads to a new life in Christ, a right relationship with God, or made possible through the redemptive acts of God in Jesus Christ. By His Spirit, He acts to impart new life and to put people into the relationship with Himself as they repent and their faith responds to His grace. Justification, regeneration, adoption, sanctification, and restoration speak significantly to entrance in, into and continuance in this new life. Oh, what did I notice there? Repent. How many times do we do that? How many times do we read God's Word and know that we still hate our enemy, but we don't repent from it? You're not going to grow until you repent. Take a child again who continues to do wrong until they realize they do wrong and sincerely repent for that, change their mind about it, the way they think about it. It will never change their heart where they won't do it. Are you repenting? Praise be that John said, if we sin, we have an advocate. We're not supposed to sin, but we will sin. Paul said, why do I continue to do the things that I don't choose to do? If Paul had to say that, I know I have to say it. And that caused me to call upon Jesus Christ to repent and turn to Him and to grow. Page 15, justification. It's a legal term. It means to be freed from both the guilt and the penalty of sin. Regeneration is a biological term. It means that we have new life, a new spiritual nature, capable of faith, love, and obedience to Christ Jesus as Lord. We're born again. We are a new creation. That means the old life has passed, the new life has become. Adoption is a filial term, a new relationship. We are wanted children. I love reading that. Desire nothing that we've done, but because God loves us, he wants to adopt us as his very own children, that we can cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. <clears throat> because our children, before, our, our father before was Satan, the devil. We were controlled by him. We lived as the way of the world. But now we are children of God, children of light. We have been sanctified. The Holy Spirit renews his people after the likeness of God from one degree of glory to another, conforming them into the image of Christ. Again, something that is lacking in a lot of the churches is the maturity when the great, the great Commission, as we call it, says to go and make disciples, right? It says after that, and it gets missed so many times, I hear it missed so many times even by pastors, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has taught us. A life of obedience, not because it's, it's tough or, or burdensome, but because it will free you to be like Christ in this world and to experience true blessings. Because if you build up kingdoms here on earth, are you building up treasures in heaven? Are you living for the one who gave his life for you? As believers surrender to God in faith and die to self, they can reach full consecration. Boy, that one, we could be here a long time. <laughs> but that means there is a point in your life, and you obtain, try to obtain it in this world, it's a free Methodist principle, that you are fully consecrated. I'll never make that in this earth. If you do, come see me because you just missed it. <laughs> okay? All right. <clears throat> 
The divided mind redirects the heart to God and empowers believers to please and serve God in their daily lives. Thus God sets his people free to love him with all their hearts, soul, mind, and strength, and to love their neighbors as themselves. Restoration. Christians may be sustained in a growing relationship with Jesus as their Savior and Lord. However, they may grieve the Holy Spirit. Big topic again. We're not talking about the ultimate sin or anything. We're talking about not doing what God is calling you to do because you because your, your self-will is stronger than God's will. You grieve the Holy Spirit in relationships with your life. That's why we have to repent. So you humbly accept the correction of the Holy Spirit. Trust in the advocacy of, the, of Jesus and let him mend your relationship. Christians can willfully and can sin willfully and sever their relationship with Christ. Even so, by repentance before God, forgiveness is granted and the relationship with Christ restored. For not every sin is a sin against the Holy Spirit and is unpardonable. However, forgiveness does not give believers liberty to sin. And believe it or not, that is a part of some thought processes again. It was a part of the thought processes in the church. We have the letters that, that say that. And there are consequences of sinning. God has given responsibility and power to the church to restore penitent believers through loving reproof, counsel, and acceptance. Jesus only mentioned the word ecclesia or church two times. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it and in church discipline. Because we have the right inside of the church to say, brother, sister, in a loving fashion, this is not right, and guess what? They have the same right to come back to us because we don't want the cancerous sin to be in this body of Christ. We want to hold each other accountable, but in a loving way. The church, page 16. The church is created by God. It's the people of God. Christ Jesus is the Lord and head. The Holy Spirit is the life and the power. It is both divine and human, heavenly and earthly, but it is imperfect too, isn't it? So we need to have grace with one another. So many people, like I said before, don't go to a certain church or any church because something that has hurt them in that church. Wow, it should not be that way. It exists to fulfill the purposes of God in Christ. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So it should be holy and without blemish. The church is the fellowship of the redeemed. They preach the word of God and administer the sacraments. <clears throat> if in its requirements, it seeks to honor Christ and obey the written word of God. The language of worship, understood by the people. Boy, Paul had to address that because people were just going crazy with tongues. There were no interpreters or anything else. Why were they doing tongues? Because it came from the Holy Spirit? No, because they wanted to do it themselves to glorify themselves. And so tongues is such an issue, but it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Holy Sacraments. Main two sacraments that we have in the uh, Free Methodist Church are water baptism and Lord's Supper. What is water baptism? It's an outward sign of your inward belief. Okay, And the Lord's Supper, we do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. We partake in wine or juice and bread because we remember what Jesus Christ did for us. Not only what He did on the cross, but what He did to bring us back into a right relationship with God that He sent the Holy Spirit with the Father to come to us, that He will not orphan us, that He is preparing a home for us, that we should fix our eyes on Him, all of those things as we longingly wait for Him to make all things new. They are a means of grace, and I've talked about that before. I would say more they are a, not a way to grace, but a special moment of grace is how I would say it. Okay? There are other sacraments in other denominations. These sacraments are signs and remembrance of grace already given, grace given today, and grace continually given. Baptism. Water baptism is a sacrament of the church. It's commanded by our Lord. It's a declaration of faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Baptism is a symbol of the new covenant of grace as circumcision was a symbol of the old covenant. Since infants are recognized as being included in atonement, they may be baptized upon the request of parents who shall give assur assurance for them of necessary Christian training. Okay, here's where I disagree. Does that make me not a free Methodist? I hope not. 
I hope if I got judged by Free Methodist Church USA, they wouldn't condemn me for that. There's quite a difference, and we can disagree about things and still come together, but the, the uh, circumcision was done so that God's people would be made known. Baptism is individual, that I have decided by faith to be a child of God, so I get baptized. So, in the book of discipline, there's also a thing about dedication. So, if you came to me and say, can I have my infant? We're not talking about a child that's made a decision later. Can I have my infant baptized? I'm going to point you towards an infant dedication. Okay? That you train up that child in the way of the Lord. And when that child makes that decision for themselves, they become baptized. In fact, if you read on down at the bottom, they shall be required to affirm the vow for themselves before being accepted into church membership. Well, then why would that, should that have to be done if I was baptized already? Okay? I've said my piece. <laughs> I'm going on. If you ask me to baptize a child, I'm going to say I will dedicate the child. I'm not, not a free Methodist because I disagreed with that. Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper is a sacrament. To those who rightly, worthily, worthily, and with faith receive it. I could have said something totally different. They are partaking in the body of Christ. They are partaking in the blood of Christ. It is a sign of love and unity that Christians have among themselves. And remember when Jesus longed to eat that Passover dinner. And you've got to go back and study the Old Testament to see all of the implications of Jesus being the spotless lamb that was given for us. What he did after taking the supper, even with Judas, was he washed their feet. And he said, I have set a pattern of love before you, a pattern of service, doing the most despicable, humbling thing of the day, but it's because I love you and want to be united in fellowship with you. Christ, accordingly to his promise, is really present in the sacrament. I'm struggling with that one. Why it's written there. Not struggling with it because Jesus said, I would never forsake you, be with me, period. But when we come and take the Lord's Supper, I guess it's all a matter in your heart of what you are remembering of Jesus to feel his presence even more than. Does that make sense? Because he's there with you, period. He will never forsake you, never leave you. I don't want this moment to be any more holy because you think that it is supposed to be special and there's some special power, but I also don't want you to think it be less holy. I'm trying to say that in the best way that I can say it. Because we do this in remembrance and if we truly repent and we truly, truly take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner and realize the grace upon grace upon grace that God has given us so that we can be a gracious people for Him, then we'll live a little differently in this world. Because God loves us so much that he would send his one and only son to die for our sins. So that's why we do this in remembrance of Jesus. And whether he's any more present or not present to you at that time, like I said, I think it's more of how your heart is focused on him because he's always there with you. You seem to remember that. I seem to remember that when times are good, but when we get that valley low, we seem to forget it sometimes, don't we? But Jesus will never, ever forsake us. The bread and wine are not literally the body and blood of Christ. Last things, page 17, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a prominent Bible theme providing Christians with both their tasks and their hope. We live the way we live because of the hope we have. Peter writes that, that we live such humble lives that we live lives of submission even husbands, uh, wives to husbands and slaves to their masters, that people will see the hope that we have, the way that we live, and they will ask us to explain that hope that we have. And we're to do that with humility and kindness. God's reign is established in the hearts and lives of believers. The church, by its prayers, example, and proclamation of the gospel, is the appointed and appropriate instrument of God's God in building His kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But the kingdom is also future and is related to the return of Christ when judgment will fall upon the present order. Oh, that gives us urgency, doesn't it? The enemies of Christ will be subdued. The reign of God will be established. A total cosmic renewal which is both material and moral shall occur. And the hope of the redeemed will be fully realized. You better be waiting. You better be urgently looking. You better be living as if today was the day. 
because Christ will return. It is a certain event. The return of Christ is certain and may occur at any moment. The believer's response is joyous expectation, watchfulness, readiness, and diligence. Resurrection. There is a bodily resurrection from the dead. Both of the just and unjust. One will be resurrected to eternal life. The other unto eternal damnation. You can have whatever concept you want to of hell and everything else. But I'll say this and this is how I say it most of the time. You will be separated from God for all eternity. I don't care what you think about flames or this or that or anything else. You will be separated from God for all eternity. Everything that comes down from the Father that is good, you will never, ever experience again. Wow, the gift that Jesus Christ gives us because we cannot make atonement for our own sins. Judgment. God has an appointed day that this will happen. He will judge the world in righteousness according with the Gospels and our deeds in this life. Uh-oh. Final destiny. Determined by God's grace. Those who trust Him and obediently follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. There is a heaven of eternal glory and the blessedness of Christ's presence. But for the final, finally impotent, impotent, thank you, there is a hell of eternal suffering and of separation from God. So that leads us to page 18, the membership covenant and the Christian journey. You agree that you want to be a part of a church. You proclaim that or don't proclaim that. And there is a Christian journey. Life in Christ is a journey, not a destination. So many people just think it's about the destination. We live day to day seeking to love God, love our neighbors as ourselves, serve Him with a whole heart, and be a witness of His goodness to others along the way. More about the membership covenant Christian journey can be found in the book of Discipline. Can you imagine the power, love, and beauty of a church that in harmony all live fully into these covenant commitments? Wow. Do you understand what it means to be a part of a church, not to go to this or that church? Four walled Christians. You're not, this is not in the book, so don't be looking. Four walled Christians, safe on our way, make little impact if all we do is pray. We may share our dollar, the few we, we may not need, and call it generous giving, but God will call it greed. We think not of our neighbor or pain in other lands. We have to make a living, achieve our goals and plans. We go to church each Sunday like Christians ought to do, but after every service, we haven't changed our view. We live so isolated, so far from hurt and pain, we stifle our own conscience time and time again. But what if Rwanda would happen in our land, and we should feel that heartache and need that helping hand? Would we think that a Christian who had the means and power should send relief and comfort in our most desperate hour? If mortar shells were falling and bombs dropped everywhere, would we want other Christians to just kneel down in prayer? I think we want assistance, involvement, and concern with no thought of repayment or favor in return. Not just a token offering, not just a passing glance, but genuine love and caring, and you start in a second chance. If we want that from others, we ought to give the same, not out of sheer compulsion, but given in Jesus' name. Don't be four walled Christians who doesn't get involved, who give a meager dollar and pray that wars are solved. Become a burden bearer, become a caring friend, stretch forth your hand in mercy, just let your life be spent. The things that are important are what God gives to you and how you use the talent that makes his message true. You cannot take it with you, you've heard that line before, but souls won for God's glory will share that heavenly shore. There's a big, big difference between going to church and being an active part guided by the Holy Spirit, maturing, building up one another for God's purpose in this world. As regard to the church on page 20, as regard to God's pe people, we express the life of Christ in the world. We are unified. We are good Christian stewards. We go into the world and make disciple. We do this by God's grace and power. If you read on, you can read more about the sacraments, but I'm going to skip to page 25 and briefly tell you what is the free Methodist way and what is part of the ethical covenant. That you believe, number one, in life giving holiness. God calls you to be holy. Again, that is something that's not a standard in some churches. You are set 
apart, sanctified to be holy, to be saints by God. That means full surrender. That means perfect love. That means holy community with one another. You believe in love-driven justice. Love is the way we demonstrate God's heart for justice. That means you love everyone. That means that you have relational, relational justice so you don't act in bigotry or hatred or prejudice or anything else. You are part of Christ-compelled multiplication, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. You proclaim salvation. You multiply disciples, teaching them to obey everything. You grow the church. You believe in cross-cultural collaboration. Collaboration. I'm flipping the page over to 27. <clears throat> you embrace diversity. You put the church's mission first. You realize that the kingdom of God is at hand. And you pray for the Father's kingdom that His kingdom come and His will be done. And God-given revelation, we hold unwaveringly to our conviction that the Bible is inspired Word of God, our final authority in matters of faith and practice. We don't add other works to it or anything else. God's Word is our guide. We read God's Word, we study God's Word, and that in leads us to embrace a life of Christian leadership in this world. There's a little book, and I'll see about getting these two if you want to look at it. It's called A Life Checkup. And ask some questions <laughs> so we can get to the point here. Love. Is there anyone against whom you are harboring bitterness, resentment, or jealousy? Are you willing to forgive them in your hearts? Are you irritable, cranky, or impatient, focusing more on your own agenda or needs? Do you speak unkindly about people when they're not present? Have you recently served the poor, imprisoned, sick, elderly, or struggling person? Are you intentionally building a relationship with a spiritually lost person? Do you regularly invest private time to bathe your soul in the love of God? Do you sense your heart filled with God's love, overflowing with, God, with love of God for others? I think we all need to examine where we're at so that we don't think we stand more firmly than we ought to. I think you'll find scripture that backs that up. If you keep reading, you'll read more about global ministries and such in the church. And you'll see other ways that you can check in and see what's going on in the actual Free Methodist Church, which we're a part of. The church triumphant. Men speak of a church triumphant as something on earth unknown. They think us beneath the tyrant until we shall reach our home. Oh, cannot the great Redeemer prevail over Satan here? Or mu must we remain yet under confusion, pressed down in fear. He built on a sure foundation and said that the gates of hell against her di divine munitions can never indeed prevail. Then how can you say, dear people, how can you not be kept each day? The infinite arm is able. His word has not passed away. It is not in the church of Jesus that people yet live in sin, but in dark, dark creeds they're joining and vainly are trusting in. God's church is alone triumphant in holiness all complete, and all the dark powers of Satan she tramples beneath her feet. Thank God for a church triumphant, all pure in his word below, for the kingdom that Jesus founded does triumph ev over every foe. As we go into 2024, please look at those um, positions that I gave you. Please consider if you want to become a member or not a member. Please sit down with someone else if you don't sit down with just yourself and with God in prayer to ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what gifts He has given you. And you know it's not even wrong to pray for gifts from the Spirit. Because if you pray, God says if you're persistent in your prayers, you keep on asking, you keep on knocking, how much more will He give you the Holy Spirit than a good Father gives gifts? the Holy Spirit, so that you can live out your life like Christ in this world. But why do we worry? Why do we fear? Why do we put our, set our thoughts on the things that the pagans do? We used to live that way. But now we're empowered by the Spirit of God to live like a Christian, like Christ, a little Christ in this world. 
that we're not called to do it alone. We're called to do it with one another, with the power of God living in us, with Jesus Christ being our advocate and the Father, and by God's grace upon grace each and every day. That's what we believe as a church. I hope that's what you believe as a church. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your church. Lord, help us to be active and living in the church. Help us to put aside any of our judgmentalism, our ill feelings or hurts or anything else, and help us to love like Jesus, thinking of others. He who gave up heaven humbled himself and became the very creation that he created. To be guided by, an earthly, by earthly parents, Lord. To have to grow up, to endure and face the temptations that we face. But Lord, to live a life that was spotless and blameless before you. That when he laid down his life willingly, that you said that it was acceptable. We thank you, Lord, that, that Jesus cried out and said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. We just thank you in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So I got a few people that said they would like to become members. If they want to, come up. And we're going to pray over them and accept them into membership of this church.